I, I want to round us off here by sharing just a couple, a couple results from a survey that we conducted this last year to look at, at uh, how irrigation is being managed in, in Idaho and in Utah. Um, we have, I know everyone loves surveys, <laughs> um, but, but they provide a lot of critical and important information about what, uh, what trends are happening in irrigation and what, uh, what the opportunities are for us to, to improve and the opportunities there are for research and, and uh, our ability to answer and develop new questions. And, and then to do research that's actually applicable, that, that's useful, uh, that can be applied on the farm. And so uh, if you look at irrigation survey information, we have very, very little. Um, the best source of irrigation survey data that we have is from, from NAS, the National Ag Statistics Service. And every five years they conduct a census I'm sure many of you uh, love uh, and always enjoy completing that census. That's quite quite detailed um, and, and probably difficult to complete. But but as a part of the census, uh, NAS also does an irrigation survey, and so they select a subset of, of growers who irrigate, and they they send a follow up irrigation survey to. The following year after a census and so many of you have, have probably seen those and completed those and that that survey provides a lot of useful information it, it does talk about um, what crops are irrigated and how much they're irrigated with and and uh, what sources of irrigation water are used and it has a few other questions about changes in your irrigation systems conservation practices utilized or used and some other things uh, the challenge with that information from NAS is that they, they only take that information and summarize it at a state level. So for the whole state of Utah, the whole state of Idaho, it's the average of all, all farms, all conditions. And so it's really, it's really hard to uh, use that information to really help develop local, regional education and, and outreach help to to producers to to figure out how to do how to do a better job with irrigation and so um, we a group of us actually a large team uh, some cooperators here at utah state university uh, along with with many others from brigham young university in provo brigham young university idaho and rexburg university of idaho uh, multiple locations all came together to develop a what we hoped was a simple survey to try to collect a little bit more information about irrigation practices in, in Idaho and Utah uh, so that we could learn what, what's happening, what are some of the opportunities, and how can we, how can we meet some of the needs that exist with, with irrigation. If you completed that survey, huge thank you uh, for taking time to, to send to complete and, and to send that survey in. Um, the premise of that survey, we, we really kind of focused on four areas of irrigation management. And many of you are probably, have probably seen something like this before. And if you've seen it, it's probably been related to fertilizer management. So this is a really common, a really common framework, a common thing that's used for fertilizer management. So for example, if we're thinking about nitrogen, we nitrogen application to a crop like corn, we want to think about the source of that nitrogen, the rate, the timing, and the placement of, of that nitrogen fertilizer. So, it, so it's used a lot for fertilizer. Really have not seen it used much for irrigation. But we think the same, the same concepts, the same framework is, is probably quite useful for irrigation as well. And so the so to when you think about these th these uh, four areas, these four R's of irrigation management, there's lots of things that fall under underneath each each category. Uh, it's not quite as straightforward as fertilizer, uh, water. <laughs> I've learned that. Um, 
I spent five, six years working on nitrogen management for corn. And so really, really learned a lot about nitrogen management. Uh, it is tricky, but uh, when you start thinking about water and water management irrigation, uh, it, it tends to get complicated really fast. Um, so this is just a simple graphic here that kind of shows some of the things that you might think about for each of those, those R's for irrigation. So the right source, there's, uh, the right source is, is probably one of the most difficult things to, to change. It's often something that we don't have control over. And it has to do with your water rights, your water quality, um, thinking about the durability and threats to your water source. Um, it could, in the future, could be some opportunities for water leasing programs that could affect the, the source of your water. Um, the right rate and time are very related. When we think about irrigation scheduling, it, those are the two factors that we can change, right? And there's lots of things that we can do to, to adjust those, um, just the rate and the timing. And then the placement um, is another one that's kind of difficult. It's not like fertilizer where we place, uh, we place irriga irrigation with the seed or uh, two inches away from the seed. Uh, there's a little bit that we can do with placement. Um, irrigation uniformity is a big one. Uh, application efficiency, allocation within a field, within different fields, um, that type of thing is, is kind of how we can adjust our, our placement. So when we, what we did is we, we kind of used this framework to develop a survey that we sent out in 2019, so last year in the fall and into the spring. Uh, we tried to survey as, as, many, as many growers, as many water managers as possible. And we had, three diff we had three different surveys, one for potatoes, one for small grains, and one for corn. All three surveys were nearly identical, except they were tailored a little bit to each, each crop. Um, and, and so we sent those surveys out, and, and this is the kind of response that we got. Um, not quite as great as we were hoping. This was an email survey, which is difficult. You know, uh, I receive a lot of surveys in, the e in my email, and, and I also uh, a lot of emails in my, or a lot of surveys in my email. Um, but we tried email just because it was quick, it was inexpensive, and so we sent out uh, four or 5,000 emails in Idaho and Utah trying to, to have um, people complete these surveys. So here you can kind of see the total, the total number of surveys that we received and where we received them from. So we received the most small grain surveys and then corn uh, did not receive very many potato surveys. That was a harder group to survey. Um, and so in total, we had just, just a little bit over 200 responses uh, for each of these or, or combined for, for these three crops. So now I just want to quickly go through a few, a few initial results. These are just these are very uh, preliminary, um, just kind of an initial stages of summarizing some of this this data. And so we will in the coming months we will spend a lot of time really parsing out everything and comparing each question to one another, and and looking for. Um, differences and trends and other things like that to really make sure that we understand this data. But today, just for the sake of time and where we're at in this analysis, I'm just going to share just a few quick things. So first, uh, we covered, so this is the 210 total um, responses that we had. A majority of them had pivot or lateral irrigation. Uh, the next was flood or furrow. And then about 10% of them had wheel line irrigation. So not surprising, that's kind of what we, the general trend we see, we're seeing more and more pivots and laterals uh, in many parts of Utah and Idaho, and less, uh, in many places, less flood and, and furrow irrigation. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a lot, of pie, a lot of pie charts, and they can get kind of, uh, messy and difficult to look at, but I, I just want to point out a few things. And hopefully you can see my, my mouse here as I move it. 
Um, so one question was, what, what methods are, they, are farmers using to set their irrigation rates? So you've got each crop and then you've got a variety of different methods. And I don't, I don't expect you to spend time looking at all those. So I just want to point out a couple. So, so for rate, uh, just look at the green, the green parts of these pie charts. So uh, past experience of the growers, their, their experience on those fields is, is the most common method used to set irrigation rates, especially for corn and for small grains. Uh, that's where we had a lot of the, a lot of the data. Um, water rights, if you look at the orange uh, pies here, was another big one, um, which just indicates that a lot of growers are probably constrained. Um, this probably happens a lot in flood irrigation where you have to have a certain amount of water to get, get the, or a certain amount of irrigation just to get the water down the field. And sometimes that amount is, is restricted by what your, what your rotter right is, what you can uh, divert at any given irrigation. A uh, related question is how, how are farmers scheduling their irrigation? And the, this one, uh, so this would be your timing, how frequently irrigation is applied. Um, I just want to point out here these green, these green pies are a soil moisture sensor, some type of soil moisture monitoring. Uh, I guess that could be sensors, it could be also just feeling moisture by hand or other methods, but um, it is encouraging that a, a, a significant amount of growers are using some type of, of soil moisture monitoring to guide, to guide their irrigation timing. Uh, this was especially apparent in potatoes. We do have much less information for potatoes, but it seems that, that uh, that's happening a lot more, probably because potatoes tend to be a higher value crop than, than corn and small grains in, in many instances. Um, there are just also want to point out the orange. Uh, the orange is showing that, that there's some constraints with water availability. That goes back to our water rights discussion. That, that some are just probably constrained on, on uh, availability of that water. And that sets their schedule and there's not much they can do about it. Uh, we also asked about VRI. This was something that Neil, Neil talked about. Our, our impression has always been that VRI acceptance and use is quite low. Uh, and so we asked just to, to be sure. <laughs> and, and what you see here is that Yes, in a lot of cases, VRI is not, not being used. Um, so 40, 50% of the corn, um, 50, 60% of the small grains, no use of, of variable rate irrigation. So quite, quite a bit. But it was also encouraging to see that, that it is happening, right? So up to 25% of, of acres, um, on some operations, we're using using variable rate irrigation, and even more, up to 50 and up to 75 percent in some, you know, in just a handful of operations. Um, and so, especially for corn, and to a smaller extent the other crops, there is some some acceptance and some use of of VRI irrigation. This question asked. For those that were doing VRI, how, do, how are they setting their prescriptions? And th this is critical. So there's lots of ways to do VRI, but, but uh, also lots of uncertainty about the best approach to setting your prescriptions. And so just, just point out here, again, that past experience, this, this I don't know what color that is, burnt orange, um, shows that that's one of the biggest factors used to set VRI by, by those that are doing it. Uh, another question that kind of interesting, if you want to know when people are stopping their irrigation, we, we figured there was some variability in this and we wanted to know what kind of opportunities there were. And so uh, you'll just point out quickly for corn, most were stopping at the dent stage, um, but there's quite a bit in the dough and maturity, R6 stage. Um, probably has to relate, probably relates to whether they were taking this for silage or grain. We have that information, we just haven't, haven't parsed that out yet. Um, for small grains, I just want you to notice that there's a lot of variability, and we anticipated this would be the case. Um, most, most are stopping, or about half are stopping at the dough stage, but there's a lot that are stopping at earlier, 
earlier stages. Um, so lots of variation in when, when they stop irrigation for small grains. Uh, so why did they stop irrigation um, in corn? The major reason was that it, it was done. The corn had enough water. Um, just a few in orange <laughs> indicate that they didn't have enough water. Uh, so that's why they had to stop. For small grains, again, most people are, had adequate water and they just stopped it when they felt like the, the crop had enough. Um, but there was some, quite you know, 10, 15 percent, that said they needed to concentrate that water on other crops. So that's why they had to stop stop the irrigation when they did. Um, these last couple questions were just to to kind of get at farmers' uh, attitudes about conserving water and and how they how they deal deal with limited water. And so this was a question in drought years: How do you modify your irrigation? Uh, and so, just want to point out a couple things. So, most people say they modify their irrigation, the yellow. Um, there's some that, that do not. So, the dark or the orange here, um, 25 to 30% say they don't. They don't do anything different when there's a drought year. Uh, it's possibly because they have adequate water or they just are constrained and can't do much. Um, we also asked you, do you skip irrigations? Um, not very many say they would skip irrigations. Um, and then we, we also asked, would you follow your normal schedule and rate until your water runs out? Just use it until it's gone. There's actually quite a few that said that that's, that's the strategy that they use when they're in, when they're in a drought year. And so I, just interesting, and I think will help us kind of look at some options for for providing some new information about what, what are the best options when you're in a drought year, what's the best way to allocate and use your water when it's restricted and limited. And then this, this was kind of an interesting question. If the price of your water were to double, how would you change your irrigation? And so if you look at the orange there, nearly half of the growers said, yes, I would modify my irrigation. But almost the same amount, the gray, said they would not change their irrigation. So about half and half. <laughs> um, and, and then you've got a small percentage of people that say, if it were to double, I would, I would put on less, less irrigation or I would skip irrigations. Um, so kind of interesting, I kind of split right down the middle. Um, but we were trying to get at that idea is if, if water becomes more expensive, which could happen in the future, how is it going to impact irrigation use and, uh, and management? And then last year, we asked how growers how satisfied they were with their irrigation, just to kind of see where, where they feel like they're at and what, um, what kind of help and, and assistance might they need. And so if you look at, at the, the gray, which is very unsatisfied. There's not very many. Um, most people were at least somewhat or very satisfied. But you look at the blue, so just look at the blue pieces here. It shows that there's for corn, at least corn and small grains, there's more than half the growers that wouldn't, that did not indicate they were very satisfied, meaning that there's, there's things that just uh, would like to change about their irrigation. Um, and it could be quite broad. We, we really didn't ask for specifics here, but um, so running short of time here, but that, that's just an initial kind of over, overview of some of the things that we're asking in the survey. We did ask a lot of other questions and we will be doing lots of other comparisons, but just kind of wanted to give you a sense of, of the fact that we have this and, and we're, we're going through it and hope to, to use it to, to really guide the effort, research and education efforts that we that we do here. So that's it. Thanks, Jody.